Welcome to uh, FORCE 2023, the annual conference of FORCE 11. Um, we are here. Um, um, we're very glad you're here. Um, the global membership of FORCE 11, we're individuals working together to make positive changes in scholarly communication. Um, and here's information about um, how you could become a, a member of FORCE 11, available at that link. Um, we want to um, thank our sponsors, um, who you can see listed here for um, making this event possible. Um, and here's some information about how sessions will be handled. Um, they're all taking place via Zoom with recordings made available after the event. Um, and here is the our ways to connect with a conference on um, Zoom, on Zoom, Slack, um, and our website. Um, just a brief coming attraction about Fisky 2023 coming up. Um, and we may circle back to this again as we conclude these lightning talks. Um, I want to do just a quick um, check with our speakers um, to see to confirm that you are able to um, screen share. Um, so if um, so Jefferson, I believe you are my um, first speaker. Can you just check if you have screen sharing or need additional permissions? I see the button. I'll give it a shot. Okay. Excellent, good sign. Then let me um, mention briefly what our procedure will be for timing. And fortunately, again, this can be a relaxed session. We're not tight on time, but I'm, we have allowed 10 minutes for each lightning talk. And at, I'm gonna black out my um, video when um, the speaker is speaking. I will come back at eight minutes, so you'll see my face again, but don't, don't flinch just because you see my face. Um, at nine minutes, I will hold up a yellow um, indicator. At 10 minutes, I will hold up a red indicator. And if you do want to make sure that you see the timing, um, you can um, use the option to pin me as a speaker. Um, that'll make sure I'm, I'm visible. Um, but we are... Um, we're, like I said, we're not tight on time due to some other schedule changes. So we're looking for a nice, relaxed, um, and enjoyable lightning talk session. Um, and we'll probably have time to follow up with a, a bit of a gentle Q&A afterwards for the speakers as well. Um, you're also welcome to put your um, questions in the chat as they speak. Um, I'm looking forward um, very much to our first lightning talk speaker, who is uh, Jefferson Bailey from the Internet Archive Project um, talking with us about um, Project Jasper. Um, so let's um, go ahead and get started with our um, first speaker. Welcome, Jefferson Bailey. All right, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you to Force 11, of course, for uh, letting us do this lightning talk, and thank you to all of you for showing up today. So I am here representing a multi-institutional project. Um, and our project is called Project Jasper. And it's a collaborative initiative to ensure the preservation and access of Diamond OA scholarship. So I'm presenting on half by half of the team. I am from Internet Archive where I'm Director of Archiving Data Services, but the other organizations uh, are also participating just as much in this project. And that is CLOCKS, DOAJ, uh, Keepers Registry, and PKP. And I'll talk a little bit about more about our different roles as we go. So I'll start my timer here and kick off these slides. Oops, and it kicked off way too quickly. OK, so why did we start this project? Uh, I think a lot of people know that uh, material on the web is pretty ephemeral and that uh, a lot of open access uh, scholarly literature is currently published exclusively on the web and not even in uh, physical form sometimes. So a lot of journals have vanished from the web. It leads to a lot of reference rot. It weakens the sort of uh, 
infrastructure of research and science uh, and uh, is a sort of endemic problem with uh, all web content, but is particularly fraught for uh, scholarly outputs that are only web published. Uh, there's other challenges that we're also looking to address with this project. I mean, that's the main one. Let's preserve open access content on the web and make sure that it's around forever and accessible. Uh, but there's also other challenges. Uh, archiving and preservation solutions have their own financial and tech, uh, technical barriers. Uh, a lot of journals have limited funding. They have a little limited staff, limited time. That can be very DIY. Uh, and preservation is, even if it is on their radar, which it often isn't, uh, can be a really onerous activity that they don't have time for. So there's challenges with the archiving solutions that do exist. There's the challenges in the time and tech required for a journal to ensure that its content is being archived and is uh, accessible in perpetuity. Of course, for preservation and archiving services, it's very difficult to deal with thousands and thousands of very small uh, publishers that might have you know, limited technical knowledge or technical skills. So there's the sort of customer service, customer support challenge. And also just the awareness of the importance of preservation and archiving is a challenge. So uh, we sort of started this project working uh, with the DOAJ set of uh, members and uh, looking at some surveys, uh, almost 60% of the journals in the directory of open access journals have no active long-term digital preservation going on. So what is our project? Well, we came together. It's a collaborative group of five organizations trying to address all these problems through uh, technical integration as well as broader advocacy and outreach. Uh, we're looking to make our own services interoperable to make, uh, to facilitate this project and facilitate future projects much like it, uh, trying to create a sort of centralized repository that enables decentralized solutions towards preservation, uh, but the centralization helps with the integrations and the interoperability and then archived con content and metadata can then be redistributed uh, to various archiving agencies from there. And we are focusing pretty exclusively on diamond OA journals. So those that are nonprofit have no article processing fees. So the most open of open. Uh, as I mentioned, it's directory of open access journals, the clocks archive, us at internet archive, the keepers registry, which is run by ISSN, and uh, the PKP project, public knowledge project, which runs the OJS uh, journal publishing software. So we're trying to increase the number of journals in DOAJ whose content is actively archived, provide a piece of infrastructure that supports open access publishing community by providing basically free preservation services, uh, trying to remove some of the financial and technical barriers by, move, by meeting the publishers where they live either in the OJS software or in the DOAJ uh, application where they're already interacting and uploading article metadata, things like that. Uh, and also just fostering best practice standardization and awareness, especially among the long tail. We're not too concerned about commercial, big commercial publishers. They've got archiving down, they got the money and the time, uh, but really there's just a huge long tail of publishers uh, that, as I mentioned, don't either have the resources or aren't even really aware of why and especially not how they could be doing digital preservation. So there's about 7,500 uh, of these diamond OA journals in DOAJ that we are targeting or that are at least uh, viable candidates to participate. Um, right now, we're just this is the set that we're working with. Obviously, aspirations to expand the project uh, to other registries or to any qualifying journal, regardless of whether they're in DOAJ or not, but this is where we've started. Um, being in DOAJ has some value in that they are already participating in the platform and uploading metadata and contributing some information. So meeting them where they live is pretty easy. Uh, it also ensures that they have like, like ISSNs and in most cases, DOIs. Uh, and about 50% of those are using OJS. What is our timeline? We started these discussions in 2021 and really in 2022. And this year we're focusing on ramping up. So there was uh, a bit of surveying and you know, 
awareness building amongst the qualifying journals and outreach and things like that. We also design the technical integrations, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, and so really within the last six or eight months has been when we've uh, really been more actively recruiting uh, participating journals uh, and testing workflows and building scalability and things like that. So that's kind of where we are and looking this year basically to ramp up participation uh, and then potentially even expand it outside of uh, to other registry services or via other partnerships and include additional archiving agencies, especially ones that might already be participating uh, in the Keepers Registry. So uh, we did some surveying, um, was sort of where we got the project started and sort of it ended up that most of the journals that responded uh, fell into one of these three sort of categories to help us inform workflow and product design. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of them were using OJS um, and some of them were using the OJS versions that are compatible with the uh, PKP locks network. So they have a preservation network uh, that basically is part of later versions of OJS. So you can sort of one click to be added into the PKP locks network. So that is an option for some of them. For some it's not because they're using an older, older version. So we've been creating documentation and help resources for upgrading your instance and things like that. And others that uh, at least have the technical ability uh, can upload the metadata for their journals as well as the full text and like PDF and things like that via the DOAJ platform. And that is distributed uh, to clocks as well as archived within IA. And those that can't do that can be added to some of the more large scale automated web archiving that we do at Internet Archive. So that is a very automated and best effort uh, kind of work. Um, so one of these three models will basically apply to most of the qualifying journals, sort of one click in OJS, ability to contribute content directly and that have it integrated by the project or just, hey, please go crawl our website and preserve the content that way. So different, different paths in uh, depending on various factors for the journal uh, or publisher itself. So ingesting the content, as I mentioned, uh, some of them can do the PKP method. Some of them can do this integration via automated deposit. Basically there's a sort of web application in part of the well, part of the DOAJ web application includes the ability to deposit content directly there. That content is then automatically uh, transferred to Internet Archive for preservation, and then it is automatically uh, redistributed to any other uh, archiving agencies that might want to copy. Right now, that is clocks, but others have expressed interest, so we are looking to build additional integrations. So it is pretty streamlined that once you upload it via DOAJ, it gets distributed multiple copies to multiple archives. Uh, and then the crawling I mentioned, and then last but not least is the participation in the Keepers Registry. So uh, both Clocks and Internet Archive are uh, members of the Keepers Registry. This is a group, I think it's 18 organizations that are dedicated to publishing statistics about the amount of scholarly material that they are preserving. Um, and I have a slide of that later. So here it is. The slide is the next one. So if you're interested in the Keepers Registry, uh, it is a service run by ISSN. So keepers.issn.org. And there's the stats for all the various archiving agencies that publish reports at various frequencies, maybe quarterly or uh, once or twice a year of their preservation holdings, uh, specifically of scholarly material. So. Uh, and you can, of course, there's look stuff up and get other kind of statistics, but that's the high level thing. So all the material that is archived as part of this project uh, will not just be archived, but it'll also be reported out uh, in the Keepers Registry. And wrapping up as I hit nine minutes and 53 seconds, uh, what are the outcomes? I mean, I think the outcomes are pretty obvious, uh, but we are looking to build a sustainable solution. We should, I should note that this is a, a goodwill effort of all the five parties involved so far. Uh, you know, we are of course seeking funding and looking for other ways that we might be able to support uh, the project if we scale it up, which will require, you know, some additional, res a little partial staffing uh, resources, but for most part, the infrastructure 
cost are not too significant um, and the development costs were things that we could all manage ourselves. Uh, but thinking of sustainability, uh, we wanna keep it free and as easy as possible for participating publishers because those have been the barriers that we're trying to eliminate. Um, but we are of course thinking about uh, the sustainability long-term of our own project. Uh, I think it's been a really good example of just sort of uh, low effort technical integrations between different uh, web services and web applications. And I think that's laid good groundwork that we can build on for similar projects for other content or other uh, you know, participants in the whole scholarly communications ecosystem. Um, I think reporting the outcomes via the Keeper's Registry and other methods uh, was a successful, has been successful. Uh, and our at least aspirational goal through this year and maybe into next year is to try to get that number uh, of qualifying journals around 7,500 in DOAJ and get half of them into this project in some form or another. Um, whether it's a one-time deposit or an ongoing thing that they do upon the publication of each issue or whether we deal with back catalogs, who knows, um, but at least uh, scaling up participation. We have been doing some documentation and training and videos, and I think it's helped all of the participating organizations in Project Jasper to improve some of those parts of their services. Uh, and so far we have about a do dozen journals that have done uh, around 50 issues. So still sort of getting started and testing out some of the communications and the workflows and the integrations and things like that, uh, but good success so far. And that's our project. And there is our sort of main website, which is on the DOAJ site, and then the contacts and emails for all of the participants. And that's it. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. And there has been some um, lively questions coming up in the chat, um, which hopefully we'll get a chance to return to um, perhaps during the Q&A. Um, I'm definitely looking forward also to our uh, next talk. And although it's a lightning talk, it is being presented by a team, as I understand it. <laughs> um, Stephanie Towery uh, presenting along with Brianne Selman. Um, and um, it is definitely a pleasure to um, hear from them today. They're going to be talking with us about the journal of journal reviews. Um, and looks like the screen sharing is, is going great. Um, so we will um, bring up our next presenters. Awesome. Um, hi, I'm Stephanie Towery. I work at Texas State University Libraries. Um, Brianne is gonna introduce herself. We're here on behalf of our team. Um, this team is composed of librarians from many different schools in North America. And we have been meeting for a few years um, to discuss and develop this idea and um, of a journal that um, accepts reviews of journals. So um, we call it the reviews, the Journal of Journal Reviews. Um, and it's meant to address um, the problems of um, authors, um, trying to analyze and review um, places to submit. So um, I'll go to the next slide. So what we're gonna talk about today is what are the problems that we hope to address with the journal itself? Um, what our plan is, um, where we are now in this process, starting this journal, and how can we do better? So uh, we have links uh, to a form to, for feedback. Um, so we hope that you'll provide some of that. Um, and feel free to put things in the chat. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Bree. So for us, the problem space uh, kind of gets defined by the fact that we're all scholarly communications librarians. So we're all aware of the lists out there and the problems with lists out there for publishing, um, you know, in terms of the contents of them, but in terms of the, the theory behind them, there's lots of issues. We know that there's new models of publishing. We know that that means there's new models of exploitation. We're not trying to downplay it, that that's an issue, uh, but we think that the conversations around this can be a lot more nuanced than just black lists and white lists, watch lists and safe lists. Um, all of those have a fair bit of bias and limits and context. They're sort of very temporal 
Um, other scholar comms librarians might be getting a lot of questions about predatory reports, for example. It's another newer list that's circulating. Um, and and yeah, we won't get into all of the biases in those lists, but they're, uh, they're legion. So we started thinking about the work that we do as scholarly communications librarians. And we regularly do contextual reviews for our faculty who are looking uh, for publishing venues. Uh, one of the services I offer, for example, is a landscape re report where I look at different journals in their field and give them some additional information about them. And so we thought about also making that labor, that work that we do visible, shareable, useful, and scholarly. Um, so the, the journal was born. <laughs> And uh, we call it a journal of journal review reviews, a journal of journal reviews, partially because it just is fun, uh, but also does what it says on the box. So we're using the structure of journal articles to build these contextual portraits or, or contextual essays on scholarly journals. Um, it's obviously not going to be a comprehensive database. Uh, those things are pretty hard to maintain anyway, but it is a place for authors to start where they're unfamiliar with the journal. Um, so they might get some more contextual information about where to publish, but it also is a place for scholarly communications librarians and other people doing parallel work to see some of those considerations, to see that process uh, as it's transparent. And it really supports this idea of informed decision-making versus black and white thinking um, about journals and about lists. Oh, did we lose you, Stephanie? Is this me? I'm sorry. Okay, awesome. Sorry. So the structure. Um, so we wrangled uh, this and we've decided that the journal will be comprised of journal reviews. So, so that's a submission that someone makes and um, they actually write a review. Um, we do have a rubric too that we'll get to. Um, and then uh, if someone doesn't agree with the um, review, they can write a response that will also be um, I believe everything is peer reviewed. Uh, we do have open anonymous peer review um, for everything, and it is all based on our rubric. Uh, so the rubric um, sort of guides the authorship of those journal reviews, as well as when we're doing peer reviews for those journal reviews. And there's some major sections, which we're gonna go through really, really quickly. Um, but the rubric itself is, is pretty thorough. It's a, a fairly large document, but it's not meant to be used as a form. It's not a checklist. It's not a series of questions that people might answer in a really sort of straightforward way. It's meant to sort of say, here are some of the things on the spectrum of this particular question that you might wanna consider when you're writing your review. Certainly for an individual journal, there might be other questions or considerations that are relevant. Um, and we're really trying to look at the content of the journal itself. Uh, again, that move away from abstract markers of quality. So uh, simple information like, the journal and information about the reviewers. So we, we require transparency about reviewers. Um, obviously conflict of interest is very important. Uh, we, we are also encouraging use of internet, ar uh, internet archive architecture. Um, so using those archived pages uh, in case of things going down or things changing, just so that we know the actual context of when a journal was uh, reviewed, what was the case then. Um, the next area is what is the journal's transparency of practice. So do they indicate who's on the editorial board? Um, do they have, you know, uh, policies on publications, ethics? Is their scope clear, limited, bounded, um, relevant? <laughs> Uh, and then looking at the behavior in people, same thing, sort of looking at those policies around people and around the way they interact. Um, one of the things that we've heard quite commonly is that additional info is sometimes shared with authors that is in contradiction with those uh, policies. So if people have experience with that or knowledge of that, that would be something that would be relevant. Um, and then the sort of standard, you know, is the board member the board members listed actually related to the subject matter. 
Uh, in terms of equity, inclusivity, and accessibility, uh, does the journal have any information on diversity plans for increasing diversity, um, you know, discussions around it, awareness of it even? Are there clear pathways if there's waivers or discounts um, for, for whoever qualifies for that? versus advertising them? Is it easy to actually get them? And then is the content accessible to screen readers and other web best practices? And then, of course, the scholarship. Does the content of the journal indicate quality, consistency? Um, is it within the scope? Do they fit that, that stated aim? Uh, and, and this is done, obviously, outside of being a subject area expert, but there is a certain level that this can usually be assessed just by looking through journal articles. And then those relationships that the journal describes, uh, are they in fact indexed where they say they are? Do they have relationships or ties to societies or other organizations, for-profit or non-profit? Do they belong to scholarly publishers? organizations like Alaska or Cope, um, all of those sort of external things. And then finally, background and history. So is the journal's publishing history consistent? Um, can you see those back issues on the website or do you have to go to Internet Archive to find them? Uh, and, and we encourage reviewers to go off the page to look around and see what the conversations are about, but they have to be factual in reporting those. So obviously sometimes there's uh, speculation or things like that on social media, which we don't necessarily encourage, but sometimes you can also find uh, fairly fair and valid histories of different kinds of critiques in forums or, or in, in places on the web. Uh, so again, pointing to those and discussing those is sometimes going to be relevant. So where are we now in our process? Um, we have developed our policies. Uh, we've de defined and assigned our roles um, within the journal. We've created an ethical oversight structure and recruited um, people for it. Um, we have an ombudsman person. We've identified an online platform to host the journal, um, which will be OJS. Um, and we are drafting communication plans for recruitment and calls for submissions. Um, we are set up in OJS um, uh, as of now. Um, so we are welcoming any kind of feedback, anyone who wants to um, participate, who's uh, interested in being a reviewer or submitting a review. Is this you or me, Bree? Well, this is just sort of some of the areas that we often get feedback on. So it sounds like there is a bit more time for discussion than we thought there might be. Awesome. Um, so certainly, we can actually discuss it. Uh, we find that people have a lot of opinions, so we're happy to hear them and, and happy to sort of talk through some of the responses or, or thoughts we have on that. Awesome. I think that's our final slide. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you uh, very much for, for your presentation. We, we appreciate it. Um, I am just going to give a quick check to see if um, Sane has uh, joined us. I don't see her listed as a as a presenter, but um, there there were a little um, a couple of ways um, that there could have been confused. So, was just checking. I believe that um, we are just going to have the two lightning talks in this session, and and we can go to um, Q and A. And I see that there have been, um, been, like I said, some lively discussion on the um, taking place in the chat. Um, and I'm gonna go back to some of the, the questions might, that might have come in for Jefferson, and then we'll come back to our, our second set of presenters. Um, so we have a question from, from Dan Katz. If my journal is now paying someone for archiving can we switch to Jasper to save some money? And this is in the context of an unfunded diamond away journal. Um, if it's a unfunded diamond away journal that is already in DOAJ, then it is eligible to participate in Project Jasper. So uh, I don't see why not, but you know, don't blame me if somebody doesn't get paid anymore or whatever. <laughs> Okay, thank you for, for answering that question. Um, we have another question um, in the chat from Kate. Um, 
I get that preservation is the main goal here. Um, from Kate Nyhan, um, I get the preservation is the main goal here. Are there also benefits for discovery? That is a good question. Um, I would say yes. So um, at least uh, I can speak at least to the archiving agencies for uh, IA and clocks. So in Internet Archive, we have our Internet Archive Scholar Project and material that is um, archived as part of Project Jasper goes in there. And we have IA Scholar has an integration with Google Scholar, which we work pretty closely with. So material would also be discoverable uh, there. Now, if someone does not want that to happen, then we we don't do it or provide uh, redundant access via other platforms. But uh, I think that would help discovery. Lots of people go to Google Scholar, lots of people go to Internet Archive. They might not know to go to the specific journal. So I think it helps discovery. Uh, I know for clocks that they um, they, you know, flip the switch on if journals stop uh, publishing or stop existing, that they become available via uh, clocks. So they also have a discovery tool there. And I you know, can't speak to PKP quite as well. I don't know that they have an aggregated search across all OJS instances and locks networks are not discovery networks, they're preservation networks. But I think between clocks and between Internet Archive, those provide redundant uh, locations where content can be discovered and especially be discovered if it is no longer available on the web, obviously, as part of the preservation part. But I do think it facilitates discovery a little bit as well. Thanks. Um, and we have one more question for Jefferson. And then I, I know that I at least have one, um, perhaps from both um, sets of presenters. Um, but uh, what funding levels are you looking for from institutions? Um, I'm not sh exactly clear what institutions means um, or whether that's the publishers that are participating. I say libraries. Um, well, we're seeking funding more from foundations, major donors or philanthropic efforts, less from uh, libraries. Um, I mean, we are ourselves a library, and I guess we're partially funding the project, so maybe there's a little, uh, there's a little of that. Um, but really seeking external sources of funding, basically to support the small amount of project staff time and maybe a little bit of the infrastructure costs. We have spent, you know, our own staff time across uh, all the participants on setting up the integrations, and there was technical work, of course, to make all the systems interoperable and all the content automatically passed amongst the parties and things like that. Um, but really more looking for just uh, funding to support mostly the project staff time. It's, it is still a burden to communicate as, as much as we've automated. I think we've lowered a lot of the barriers for the sort of uh, customer support or however you want to term that part of it. Um, which is, you know, dealing with the individual publishers and the editors and things like that when they have issues uploading something or why didn't this work or, you know, a lot of back and forth about whether they qualify or how to deal with different types of content, right? It's not always just PDFs necessarily. There's, there could be data sets and things like that. Um, so there is some, some time effort in doing, and while we've lowered them through the automation process, because people can just look at documents and participate in the project without ever talking to one of our organizations that are uh, in the project. Uh, it's still, there's always gonna be some of that. So mostly looking for funding from like foundations and grants and things like that that can help support that. And again, the fraction is pretty small. So, um, you know, we're not seeking millions of dollars. So it seems, uh, it seems feasible, but no, hasn't really been discussed or there's no real intent to uh, sort of content consumers to have them support the, the sustainability and financial sustainability. Good question. Uh, thanks. And we do have a, a question now for the Journal of Journal Reviews team. Um, beyond journals, are you considering reviews of publishers, um, maybe a publisher with multiple journals? So I think that's the case where we'd we'd sort of suggest look for an exemplar 
uh, or what's the opposite of exemplar? The bad exemplar. Look for the egregious <laughs> journal from that publisher. Review that one. Um, but again, because that that overview unfortunately lacks the granularity and the specificity. You know, um, people hate MDPI right now, but there's probably at least one or two MDPI journals that are still good and still worthwhile. Uh, so that's why we're not focusing on the publisher as much, although certainly that's not information that would be suppressed, right? If, if that's who the publisher of a journal is, it certainly adds context to add that in and a little bit of context around the, that publisher's practices um, would, would enrich the review. Uh, but we are we are looking really specifically at the journal as the unit of of critique, I guess, or or you know, uh, we want people to review good journals too. We do really want that uh, that experience to be reflected as well. Um, so uh, thank you for that. I have one um, question for. Um, I'd say for both teams, um, our, uh, the conference theme is about the global and the local. And I'm wondering if each of you can just come in and say a little bit, what does that mean um, for your topic? Um, do you want to highlight maybe a global or a local aspect of, of what you talked about today? Uh, sure, that, that's something that we've, we talk a lot about, um, because of course the, the black lists or watch lists tend to really negatively impact the global south. They tend to, you know, write off entire countries publishing efforts as, as predatory, and so we're trying to, to work on correcting that a little bit. But one of our biggest issues is that everyone currently on the board is from North America, uh, and we primarily speak English. I could I could get by in French, and I'm sure we have a few that could get by in Spanish, but we're replicating the English as the language uh, of publishing by currently only having capabilities in English. So while we rel welcome the idea of multilingual submissions, we, we can't review them currently. Uh, but yeah, that is one of the things that, that we're hoping to, to highlight, you know, like get one of those journals that has been unfairly maligned because of its country of origin and highlight how good they are at what they do. Thank you. Um, and Jefferson, do you want to close us with a um, comment on the global or local nature of, of your work? Yes, it's, uh, there's, it's definitely a global representation of publishers and journals within DOAJ. And we did intentionally target Global South and non North American Europe journals for our original sets of direct outreach. Um, so while you can, you know, publicize the project as much as you want, it's still, you still need to talk to some people directly. So that was something we took into account in developing the um, direct engagement plan. And we also translated a number of the materials into um, many different languages. So some of the material around OJS as well as the project documentation specific to the DOAJ method of uh, content deposit are multilingual. So definitely took global audience into account because it does represent a large part of the uh, publisher community that we're looking at. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to review our um, presentation here of um, information about the session and the conference as we close things out um, and thank everyone for your um, participation in the meeting today. Um, we're glad you're here at FORCE 2023, um, Future of Research Communications and E-Scholarship um, is the mission of FORCE 11. We're working to make positive changes in scholarly communication and you can become a member and membership is free. Um, we do want to thank the sponsors that have made this um, event possible. And um, here are some ways you can continue to engage with the conference um, through Zoom, SCED, um, the Force 11 Slack, um, or hashtag um, Force 11 Conference. 
and um, also mark your calendars for the upcoming um, Fiskey 2023 um, event coming up July 31st through August 4th, where um, there will be 14 courses. And this little tidbit for those of you who are still here, one of them will be taught by me. Um, so hope to see you there. Um, and you can find out more um, at um, the link there for Fiskey. Thank you, everyone. Have a good um, evening or afternoon, um, wherever you are, um, and hope to see you at future sessions. And thank you, Bye. Jennifer, for um, all of your work and making this effort and all of our speakers today. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, we have fabulous um, couple of days coming up, including some wonderful keynotes, some additional lightning talks and presentations, and there's a workshop tomorrow uh, run by Sebastian Kircher, if you're interested in that uh, out of Syracuse. But have a great evening, uh, morning, or afternoon, wherever you are. Thanks so much.